Um, welcome back to the Angerati studio. Uh, we're here with Ellen Diskin, who is the an engineer at uh, ESB Networks, uh, which is uh, the distribution uh, network owner in, in Ireland. And uh, we were talking a little bit uh, off air, and it's uh, particularly good to have Ellen's uh, perspective on things because uh, we've had a lot of conversation about people who are essentially trying to get companies to invest and take on new products, take on new service, take on new tech. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, firstly, welcome, obviously. And we were talking a little bit uh, off air, and it must be a huge challenge for you guys to think about where you're putting the investment because you've got all of these promises that are being sold, like we're all going to be driving electric cars in the next 10 years or whatever it is. And there's a Tesla car here on show as well. And, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of other uh, things that consumers are being encouraged to do or want to do, um, like generate their own energy. All of that puts pressure on the network. Yeah. So uh, how are you guys managing to sort of stay that one step ahead? That's a question that has just so many loaded angles in it. But no, I, I suppose where you mentioned predicting, we can't predict, we have to, we have to work in assumptions. The, for, the, the assumptions which used to be standing, that customers behaved in a particular way. To an extent, they do stand. When they have larger technologies, new loads, they change, they just grow upwards. And then when they're told that if you respond in a certain way, you'll be paid for it, you've got a whole new type of behavior. The thing is, we don't have massive cases of thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers behaving a certain way yet, so we don't even know what they'll do. As a DSO, our job is to ensure that we have the technological solutions to meet whatever happens, only without massively investing in one solution or another and then find that we have a stranded investment. So we could put all our eggs is, in... Is that the unpredictability side of things? Because you, you were talking about mm. customers getting paid to adopt a certain behavior, mm. which I would imagine you're talking about demand response and you know, turn mm. your washing machine on at night rather than during the day or, or whenever yeah. someone wants you to. Um, so what, you know, just explain a little bit what, mm. what that sort of... Let's assume for a second that behavior change is adopted. Okay. Uh, and what does that do to your network and your infrastructure? What's the cause and effect? Well, changing behaviors, if you have a network built in the premise that people behave in a certain way and they suddenly all start behaving in a completely different way, which beautifully meets the needs of a particular wholesale market player or beautifully balances wind on the other side of the country, it might horribly overload the network where we are. And our options are we can, we can put massive physical built investment into the network, but that's going to cost a lot of money. Alternatively, if we say there's only going to be a limited amount of demand response or change behavioral phenomena, then we can have a mixture of built investments and online monitoring approvals management. But there's only a limited additional capacity that'll give you. Now, in ESP Networks, we're trying to take an approach which combines technological development, so getting the monitoring, the telecoms capabilities in place, ensuring that we have a solution which we can go with that way, insofar as it gives us the additional capacity we need, educating ourselves on the underlying behavioral patterns. So we're working with IBM on data analysis, on seeing how customers actually behave, how well we can model that, how much real-time information we need, and how much certain underlying assumptions really do hold. And, and when, when you're saying that uh, you know, you're working and you're looking at that whole data analytics piece, is mm. that down to a level where you're using the data that you can now get, which is you know, terabytes of more data than you ever had before, uh, to actually go to granularity of saying, well, what you know, uh, are you using that to do sort of prediction modeling? Like, okay, how many people are actually taking up smart washing machines that can turn themselves on and off at the right time and all mm. that sort of stuff? Is, is that the sort of level of uh, analysis? Our analysis isn't trying to predict who's going to uptake what. To be honest, the first thing we need to know is the underlying load behavior. Uptake of certain loads, really all we can do is say, 
how many of these loads a given network can handle at a given time. We can make educated guesses as to if all of those participate in the same program, it'll put that amount of pressure in the network. When we've decided, okay, how, well, it's a matter of physics how much pressure a certain penetration will put in the network. We need to make the, make the judgment call as to whether we expect that amount of uptake to happen. And we need to be sensible about it. As a DSO, okay, I keep hearing that demand response or new customer behavior patterns are part of a democratization of electricity system, of energy markets. I don't believe that in that a low income family can't afford to participate in the same way that a high income one can because they can pay for the loads. They can pay for a great big dishwasher which turns on and off, which has an awful lot of kilowatts. So demand response in itself isn't democratization. The role of a DSO is to use the money which everybody puts into the electricity system to deliver the capacity that everybody needs and beyond that, uptake of certain things. It's down to regulators to decide who funds what. But as a DSO, we find the technological solutions. We can, we can do a pilot where we say, okay, here is a monitoring and control system. Here's the additional capacity you get it. Alternatively, here's the cost of operating that network. We can tell you that once the penetration of demand response of electric vehicles, of storage heaters on that network hits that percentage, no amount of online management will give you any response because everybody else's underlying load has grown up. Regulator, who pays for the network? Who is driving this additional infrastructural need? Or do you want us to continue with the management and accept that there's going to be a level of curtailment? As a DSO, it's not our decision to make. It's the regulator's decision because ultimately the regulator is the one who protects the customer. As the DSO, we come up with the effective, efficient technological solutions. We apply understanding of electricity networks. Increasingly, we're bringing in a telecoms function. We're working with them to, well, we know how to deliver cost-effective networks. We know how to put in the kind of conductor that will give you the right level of losses to balance the right amount of demand. We don't know how to put in, well, we don't yet know how to put in the telecoms infrastructure that meets the specific needs of a specific monitoring system, system or control system. Our telecoms function do. We work with them to balance the electricity system with the telecom system. And this is about getting that operational IT layer over the top of it to know what's happening where and being able exactly. to, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but yes. being able spoke to move to it about the masses and masses of data that we suddenly have available to us. We don't yet have that available to us. Mm. That's a myth. God knows, with smart metering everywhere, we may have that available to us. That said, we may not. Mm. Putting in the telecoms infrastructure to give us all of that metering information in real time would be ex exceptionally expensive. Mm. It would put a massive burden on whatever telecom system. Well, that's that's interesting because when when you hear vendors of this technology talk, yeah. um, you get a feeling that all of this data is already sat somewhere in some cloud and no one's doing anything with it. But you're, what you're saying is completely different. You're like, going, yes. well, that's, that's kind of the, the vision, but the real world is... Yeah. The real world is that the data isn't yet there. As a DSO, we have slowly, incrementally been increasing our data streams based on very specific operational needs. And to date, it's working very well. That said, to date, we don't have the masses of demand response and variable generation. It's very high, but it's still manageable. Now, the masses and masses of data, which we may in the future have available to us, it's only useful, it'll only offer a benefit if we actually know that it gives us a benefit. If we know that we've done masses of offline analysis of the available data and we can do enough prediction that we don't need all of the data in real time, then you can make savings on the kind of telecoms infrastructure you need for the real time data. As a DSO, ESB Networks is looking at the existing data and trying to work out what our actual operational needs in terms of data are going to be so that we don't put in a massive overkill of an infrastructure to have data which we don't have a capability maybe to manage or if we put in the capability to manage it we realize but there's no particular benefit from managing it because... Or almost the data might come too late. So, you know, by the time you get all, you know, hypothetically speaking, by the time you get all the data, 
you know, like, going, well, hang on a minute, we needed to have made this investment five years ago because the, the sort of things you're talking about, it's not like, you know, going down to Maplins and buying a new cable. You know, mm. this, is, this is a big deal. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a, it takes a lot of uh, uh, thinking about. If I were to uh, ask you to look at, and you've obviously seen a lot of conversations, you've, you've probably heard the same sort of things that I've, uh, I've uh, been hearing about, oh, this is easy to do, we've got the data analytics, blah, 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 and you're living in the real world. If I could ask you, what is your, your single biggest, when you, when you look at some of the talk that's coming out about uh, wanting to change behavior, change the way things is done, changing the way uh, uh, um, uh, uh, energy use is, uh, uh, is carried out, What's your single biggest uh, sort of worry when you like go, yeah, that really sounds like a good idea in principle, but I really hope they don't do it because they haven't understood the pressure it's going to put on the carrier network effectively. Okay. When you said that we're all hearing that this is easy to do, that's easy to do. Technologically, that's true. Things are becoming ever more easy to do. And as a DSO, that's great because when we try to work out how in the name of God we're going to mitigate people doing things that we worry about, we know that, okay, they have the technological solutions that they can do something that mightn't be great, but we can come up with a technological solution to deal with it in some way, shape or form. What I worry about is the amount of solutions, and I question the term solution, which are developed based on a premise which is wholly uninformed someone decides that there's masses of latent capacity in a network or all demand should work to instantly balance all generation. And the solution is developed by someone who sees a business case for themselves but doesn't realize that there are underlying physical obstructions to what they're proposing. And oh, I suppose when you bring together economics, environmental concerns, policy, politics, and you try to overlay them on what's a question of physics because demand and generation it's all a question of physics really and doing it in the most efficient way is a question of physics when you overlay it with an awful lot of different perceptive perceptions and viewpoints and a lot of people who know a lot about their specific area I know loads about wholesale markets or I know loads about human behavior and I know nothing about frequency I know nothing about thermal capacity I know nothing about say assumptions of diversity in the in the delivery of a cost effective electricity system and therein uh, lies the collision doesn't it because yes. at the end of the day it's all down to some very old equations like mm. uh, you know resistance equations and voltage equations and all that sort of stuff which let's face it up up until we've got a room temperature superconductor that ain't going to change for us mm. uh, and you, you 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 get this collision about all these great ideas and people are, don't really understand the underlying physics yes oh no there there are loads of there are loads of complex or even simple solutions there are market solutions there are physical solutions there are it solutions some of them work together others work divergently completely and they're all being developed without people maybe questioning why what's the aim I don't know what the aim is I know as a DSO my job is to facilitate to facilitate customers and to do that in a cost-effective manner but I do worry about the amount of solutions to problems which may or may not exist and which have ultimately massively divergent objectives and outcomes and which at the end of the day put a uh, put a uh, different pressure on you guys because mm. as you said earlier we may be building an infrastructure we don't need and we may be building an infrastructure we, n we don't need we may be building an infrastructure we do need regardless of whether we do or don't need it someone has to pay for it who pays for it is it the person who's driving the need? Is it the person who happens to be present on top of the person who's driving the need, thus also using the same capacity? I don't know. There's a lack of clarity around any of it and a lack of awareness on the part of an awful lot of players in this. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of what happens when you get a collision of uh, people who've uh, you know, perhaps had data analytics solutions in a telecoms world and understand that market and they're entering into this. But forgetting that we aren't moving packets of data, we're moving 
mm. electrons from A to B, and that doesn't really work the same way. No, it, no, you, you can't schedule. No, you can't, can't schedule, schedule it. Can't, you can't stick an IP address at the beginning us. and the end. <laughs> Moreover, you even if you could schedule the electrons, you can't schedule human behavior. You yeah. can try to influence it, you can't schedule it. Yeah. No, absolutely. It, it, look, we've come to the end of our time here in the studio. Thank you very much for talking to me, and, it, and it's been really good to get a view from I, what I call the other side of the fence. And uh, thanks for taking the time. And you're, you're speaking t tomorrow, is it? Or, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Tomorrow so uh, uh, enjoy that. I'm sure it'll be a very informative talk. And uh, thank you as well for watching. This has been uh, the last Angirati interview for day one, and uh, we're probably off to have a drink and. Uh, for you guys watching online, help yourselves to one as well. Thank you.